Susan, you are a zoologist, 35 years of experience, mainly focusing on polar bears. You wrote four books about them, published over 30 papers and being an adjunct professor at the University of Victoria. Thanks for being online with me. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. The polar bear has sort of become the poster boy of climate change, right? where mainstream outlets, NGOs, politicians are letting us believe that if we are not reducing CO2, the polar bear will be iceless and wiped out. However, you wrote a book, The Polar Bear Catastrophe That Never Happened, where you are writing the animals are actually doing well today. When did this whole polarization start? The, the interest, I think, in kind of elevating polar bears to um, an icon status in terms of climate change um, really began, I think, in the late 1990s. And so you had things like uh, a lot of magazine articles and whatnot featuring polar bears um, in their discussions about climate change, partly because the predictions about the climate models predicted that the Arctic would be affected twice as fast as anywhere else. With that premise that polar bears would be affected before any other animals. In 2005, the IUCN Red List people declared that polar bears were vulnerable to extinction. And based on these predictions of what might happen to the sea ice, that was the very first time that an animal or a plant had actually been assessed for its conservation status based on a climate model. The uh, biologists that were assessing the polar bear situation for the U.S. Geological Survey, they put together a computer model that predicted the survival of polar bears that by 2050, there would be 42% less summer sea ice, that two-thirds of the polar bears in the world would be gone, and that by the end of the century, there would be virtually no polar bears left at all, that they would be virtually extinct. How did you react on these um, specific predictions? I was suspicious of that prediction from the beginning, just because I felt it underestimated um, the capacity of the animal to, to adjust. Why? Um, because you're looking more at the evolution of the animal? Absolutely. Well, all of my, all of my, um, my focus in, in looking at all of this, it's not for, for polar bears as well as all other species, is I look at what's happening in the present and I look at what's happening in the past because it's often an indication of um, really what animals can adjust to. And I, I have personally, in looking at other, other species, seen evidence that in fact, animals species are much more adaptable than anyone has even thought possible. Why do you think the models were wrong? You see, they had no observations on what the bears would do. So they were guessing about what would happen, just based on what they knew about the animals. However, Unlike me, they hadn't studied other animals through time the way that I had. So we had a different perspective on it. And what I have done over the last few years is gone back and look at their original um, predictions that were laid out in a series of U.S. Geological Survey reports. And I realized that, in fact, in 2007, at the end of September, the sea ice had already dropped down to the level that hadn't been predicted until 2050. And I just said, okay, then what has happened to the polar bears? This is what you said would happen if the ice dropped to that level, and this is what has actually happened. And what I discovered was that there's no indication that the um, population, the global population declined at all. No, not a single one of the 10 subpopulations that they predicted would be extirpated 
And in fact, the population had taken a slight increase, which was completely at odds with the prediction. Susan, what are your most important evolutionary observations from the polar bear to have? We've got um, several studies now, probably, I think by this time it's more than a dozen, um, that have looked at um, DNA evidence to try and um, discover when the polar bear arose as a species separate from the brown bear, which everyone agrees that was the ancestor. Um, at the moment, the the time, the reasonable time scale is um, somewhere between 600,000 and 400,000 years ago as being the most likely um, time. Everybody seems to get a different answer, and so there's nothing really definitive at the moment. I, I think it's possible. It might have been a bit sooner than that, but um, uh, that's kind of up in the air. Um, but so let's assume as a middle ground that we say that, that the polar bear arose as a species 400,000 years ago. Then that means there has been at least two warm interglacial periods, and that's when sea ice would have been much reduced, that were much warmer than today. And we know that they survived both of those periods. The other interesting aspect is, though, that in one of these studies, it has showed that um, it looked like really a very dramatic decline in population after the last ice age. So that is suggesting that a cold period, even for polar bears, was very detrimental to the population numbers? One of the assumptions that the polar bear biologists made with their prediction was that the bears absolutely required summer sea ice in order to hunt. But in fact, their very own papers um, emphasize that the most important season for the bears is early spring, because that's when they feed very heavily on newborn seals of various species. And so what they do is actually pack on hundreds of extra pounds of fat during the early spring, specifically so that they can survive through the summer when food is less likely to be available. And they really, polar bears do best on what's called first year ice. And that means that it's not, not thicker than two meters. And that's because the seals that they live on also do best under those conditions. So um, if the ice gets too much thicker than that, neither one of them do very well. During the dead of winter is their, is their worst period. They really, even though they're, most of them are out on the ice, they, are, they have a really hard time finding seals. So they actually don't consume very much food in the winter. They don't consume very much food in the summer, they consume two-thirds of their food in the spring and about one-third in the fall. So this assumption that summer is necessary for their survival, that summer ice is necessary for their survival, has actually been borne out by the observations. A bunch of scientists published well, in my opinion, a bit of a sleazy article, uh, basically to claim that you're spreading doubt and denying science based on, well, your observations that polar bears are actually doing well. Um, the article was um, an attack on myself, on my, uh, on my integrity as a scientist and on my credentials as a scientist and um, they questioned in fact whether my background meant that I was in any way qualified to have any kind of an opinion on polar bears and with by criticizing me so heavily they then used that to criticize any other internet blogs or um, news outlet that dared to um, quote me or publish anything that I had written. It was clear not only to me, but to very many other people that in fact, 
um, despite all all of the um, uh, attempts they had made to make it sound like a scientific um, report on 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 this issue, that in fact not they had not addressed any of the concerns that I had been raising, and the one that that um, the the main one being that in fact the bears had not declined in population size despite the lack of sea ice being the main one and so rather than come up with a scientific rebuttal for that particular assertion of mine they in fact chose to attack my integrity but the news was big and and, and went across the globe wasn't it they did manage to get absolutely international um, attention for this, and I know that even my um, my daughter-in-law's brother in Germany emailed me, and he said, "You were on the front page of the paper in my town." And you know, like this was um, what's going on. This is really big news. Um, they had issued three press releases f for this particular paper, which really I think was almost is almost unheard of, and fourteen co-authors with really no need for there to be that many, only two of which were actually polar bear scientists. All of the rest of them were, you know, had um, completely unrelated um, specialties. Um, but really what it do did was to open the world, the eyes of the world, to the fact of, of what I was trying to say. And that was my response. You know, read my blog, read my paper, and decide for yourself. It seems to me that everything you can possibly link to man-made climate change will become untouchable, whereby every form of discussion will be silenced and alarmism will be paid. Whether we talk about polar bears or whatever happening on the sea ice, I watched a, a Netflix series, um, Our Planet, and there is an extremely graphic scene where a couple of walruses fallen off the cliff and die. And I don't know what that was all about, but the makers claimed completely fact-free that this is happening due to climate change. And the rationale for that was that if there had been sea ice available, that the walruses would be on the ice and not on land. So that their logic was the only reason that the walrus were on land was because of climate change. And if they hadn't been on land, they wouldn't fall off a cliff. But as I said, one of the, um, I've not just looked at polar bears. When you look at um, an animal like that, that's um, the apex predator of their whole ecosystem, you have to look at everything that's in there. And so I had already done my own research on uh, the situation with walrus. <clears throat> and in fact, we know that there has have been large haul-outs of walruses on land going back over a hundred years. And that what happens, the correlation that, that seems to be in place is that they haul out in very large numbers um, like they had filmed um, in this sequence. Um, only when the overall population size is very large. So when that happens, as part of one of the things they showed was um, a haul out, it's called, of more than 100,000 walrus females and their calves, all uh, along of probably 30 kilometers of beach. And, um, but what they left out of the whole equation is the fact that um, one is that uh, walrus have kind of a, a boom and bust kind of cycle. So their numbers go up, well, things are very good, but when their numbers get really high, they end up eating too much of their food and they kind of eat themselves out of house and home. And then a lot of animals starve and the numbers go down again. And so um, we really only have um, one cycle, like since walrus has, have been um, protected from overhunting, but what we know is the numbers were high in the 1970s and then they naturally went down 
um, in the 90s, and then they have gone back up again. And what we know is that the numbers now are probably, they're definitely higher than they have been in the 70s, and are probably higher than they have been in a century or more. And so the, the, the reason, really the biological reason for the walruses being on the beach is because their numbers are, are so high. And that's why they're hauling out in these large numbers. And it really has nothing to do with climate change. They, will, they can only haul out on a beach if there is no ice. But there has always been times in the past during, say, September um, or August, September, when there has been no ice along that stretch of beach. And whenever there has been no ice and there's been large numbers, they haul out on the beach. So it's not climate change and no ice. It's just no ice ever. Yeah. You are obviously one of the few who dare to speak out against the narrative, um, which can be unpleasant. Um, do you feel you're fighting this battle alone or do you have colleagues supporting you? Many uh, of my colleagues and, and colleagues of um, polar bear specialists, in fact, have contacted me to let me know that they have read my work and that they agree with me. They are not saying so publicly um, because they're not in a position to do so because the issue is so political. But one of the things that has happened is that because... <laughs> Because polar bears are such a charismatic species and because when the bears were first given protection in the early 70s, um, it was all about promoting the image of the polar bear as cute and cuddly. And so the, the conserva conservation biologists who started that work at that time were considered to be almost gods, you know, like they were, they were trusted and they were a small group of people who were working in a very hostile environment on an animal whose biology no one knew very much about. And so there was n nothing for anyone to question them about. And so they got used to an environment of not being questioned about everyone trusting their every word that they said and then climate change came along and lifted polar bears to icon status and what it also did was lifted many of the senior biologists who were involved to rock star status and then they began to think some of them that they were very important and untouchable and that they were speaking some kind of um divine truth that no one should dare question. 